back to the Make Art Don't Starve podcast. I'm your host, Kelsey. And I'm your other host, Al, and today we are joined by Jennifer. Hi. Obviously, my name's Jennifer. This is all new to me, so I'm gonna probably mess up. I go by Fuzzy Dragons mostly online, but a lot of people just call me Fuzzy, which is fine, because people just, I'm kind of confused anyway a lot of times, so it kind of works. <laughs> so, that's me. Thank you so much for being here. We are so excited to talk to you. you. Emailed us and you were asking basically to talk about sort of the role that mental and physical disabilities yeah. come into play whenever when it comes to your art, like both like the act of doing it and productivity and then trying to make art a career. It sort of touches on every aspect of our lives basically, so that, that totally checks out. The disability, whether it's physical or mental, can make getting art as a career slightly more difficult because especially, well, it doesn't actually, there's no one's not worse than the other obviously but either one can make it a little difficult either in for yourself or for other people to understand what you're going through and how it maybe relates to your art which is another thing mm -hmm. that can happen but it does obviously make it a little bit more difficult to make a business with a disability yeah i think that's i mean that's obviously i don't have a physical disability that's something that i've never really thought about from my perspective i would i would think that unless you have a disability that makes it very difficult to physically do art, that having art as a career would be more accessible for people with disabilities from my, you know, uneducated perspective. So I'm really interested to hear someone with experience, your perspective on how accessible the art community is and, and how it works for people. Well, depending on disability, like mine is more of a physical disability with MS, mm -hmm. like multiple sclerosis, I can get like hand tremors or difficulty walking. So right. that makes it harder to paint, obviously. Traditional art with pencils is a lot harder because your hand's constantly shaking. And if you do like life drawing classes, which you can do, obviously having a disability doesn't stop you from doing those classes. It just makes it maybe a little bit more difficult depending on how it affects you. Because if you're standing in front of an easel all day or for a couple hours, your hand's gonna shake more or you're gonna shake more and it's gonna make you more tired so you're not going to be, maybe be able to concentrate enough to get what you need out of the class, really. It's a little hard to explain because it's, it's to me now, because I've, I had MS for, hmm, well, since, diagnosed since 2007. So to me, it's become kind of a thing I just deal with. If somebody's just been diagnosed, it might be a little bit harder for them to come to terms with, they're just going to be able to still do art, just going to have to have maybe change something slightly right. and realize they're going to maybe need a seat instead of standing in front of the easel for a couple hours, they're going to need to sit down or they're going to have to, instead of using say like charcoal or pastels for life drawing, you use something that's like markers or something that's easier to hold on for a longer time. So you can do really loose marks rather than really tight art and stuff like that. Yeah, I think with, like if you're doing life drawing classes or college or university, because they're slightly different here in Scotland compared to America in Canada. And then in uni, you do a foundation year, but then you pick, say, I did graphic design. So that's what I did for three years. But because of that, I actually think it was easier on the disability because you knew where you were going to be every day or what right. you had to do. And depending on the school, obviously, it depends on how easy it is for somebody with a disability to get around whether they're wheelchair accessible or their lifts are working, which my uni often would go down. And that was fun getting stuck once. Um, oh gosh. Yeah, oh, I was in it and I'm like, oh, this is great. And the call button wouldn't work. And I'm like, oh, great. I'm stuck in the elevator. If, if a school doesn't have like, like said, elevators or ramps for wheelchairs or accommodation that gives you a seat for the, for like life drawing class or graphic design and stuff or any kind of class, it can make being disabled going to higher education slightly more difficult. It's doable. If you ask for help, you can get help, but okay. you just have to kind of ask for help. And that can be difficult too, asking for help yeah. because it can be hard to realize you need that help. And when you're just diagnosed, well, I know for myself, being, just being diagnosed, like when I was originally diagnosed, it was very hard to ask for help because you kind of like, oh, you can do everything, you know, but then you realize you can't. And the same with art, you, like, I was traditional taught, like, so oil paints and classic illustration, it was what my middle school, high school, and, like, teaching outside with was in that. But with the diagnosis, I had to stop doing that because it just wasn't physically possible to oil paint, unfortunately. 
But, I mean, I'm sure there are other options you could do. I mean, you could use brushes that were, like, maybe tied to your arm a bit more. So, like, the adaptations like that, there is ways around it. It just depends on right. how much a person wants to, how much they don't want to give up what they might want to give up. You know, because you don't want to give, that's the yeah. thing with the disability, especially art. When art's your whole life, and it has been my whole life, like, I've been drawing since I was three or four, I don't know, it's one of those kids drawing on the wall with crayons and stuff. If you don't want to give any of that up, you just have to find ways to adapt to it. And that's why I contacted you guys, because I now, years, I mean, it's been 15 years, I think, since I've been diagnosed. And so I've got hindsight, obviously, that I didn't have to give up art completely, but somebody who just got diagnosed, whether, it doesn't have to be obviously MS, it could be any disability, mental or physical, they might feel right. that they have to give up that, that, that part of them that they have to now give up, because they can't do it anymore and I don't want people to feel that way because there are ways to get around it it's just asking for help it helps obviously but realizing it's not maybe gonna be the same but you can still create you're still gonna be able to do something creative I have a question actually yeah. about specifically your experience of it sounds like you were you know traditional education yeah. going to art school do you feel that you're, and, and when you're doing that, you're very reliant on the facilities and yeah. what they are able to provide to you. Yeah. Do you think that being an artist online, how is that experience different? Is it better? Is it worse? It's easier. It's not easier to sell, obviously. That's still, you've got to still market and do all the stuff you would normally have to do, like, right. in person. You, you know, you still have to do all that, which, you know, is a job in itself, obviously. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, right. Being having all the stuff that's available online now, it does make being disabled and being an artist a lot easier. You can get your art out there easier to people uh, and show people that it is possible to create. And I don't personally use my art for my disability. I did the graphic de design stuff related to like for charts and stuff for like MS and stuff, but I don't actually use it for painting or drawing. But I do know some artists that do do that. So being able to get that online, it shows other people, whether they're disabled or not, it brings awareness of that disability through their art. So that's how a person deals with it that way. But I mean, I've thought about it, but I've never done it. Like I said, to me, it's it's a, not a normal thing, obviously, but it's such a it's such a thing now that I don't, you know, obviously if somebody asks me questions, like I said, and if you ask me questions, I'm more than willing to talk about it because, I mean, EMS specifically, not a lot of people know about it. They do know about it, but they don't know exactly what it does. I mean, and same thing with, I mean, when I was in college, I had a, a friend who had cystic fibrosis. She did have a hard time, unfortunately, but that was because other people, not because of the school. I will say the school was really right. good for her, but it was other people that didn't quite understand why she was there. And in reality, she was just trying to be like every able-bodied person out there that, you know, just, just have a life. Another thing I would, would want people to know that people with that are disabled, mental or physical, they just want to have a life that's right. normal is can be. I mean, the college the, that college was good with people with disabilities. At the time, I was early diagnosed when I went to college, so I wasn't too needing help at that point in time. I was more helping the other people with disabilities, not so much with the physical acts, but because I am I am very outspoken and very. If I see something wrong happening, I will call somebody on it, obviously. So when somebody was getting picked on because of their disability, I would say something because they couldn't. But because I've got the confidence to do it, I think I had to not so much stand up for those people, but because they couldn't and they needed help, it bugged me at the time because it's like people, they all they saw was a disability. They didn't see somebody trying to have a normal life to get on with the art that they wanted to make because they, that's what the art was passion that they wanted to do. I wish actually more people realized that, that art, because art can be a passion. It's not a passion for everybody, obviously, but it can be a passion for some people. I wish more people knew that, that it's just because you're disabled doesn't mean that you can't still create. You might, right. like I said, you might be doing things differently, but you're still creating, you know, you just have to do adaptations. Have you found that like that discrimination that you are sometimes experiencing people like also disabilities are also experiencing in like higher education and at university is mitigated by being on the other side of a screen and having the anonymity of online? I'm not, I don't hide my disability online though. I guess maybe if I did, but I don't hide it online. I can understand what people do because of that stigma around it. I just don't see the point in hiding it because it is who I am really, you know, it is a part of me. So yeah. I, I yeah. don't see why I'm going to hide it, you know? 
-hmm. I don't obviously like announce to the world, hey, I've got MS, you know? But if it came up in conversation, or I've had people at like, on Discord, for example, I've had people even ask me like, what, what do you mean MS? People ask me, well, how does that affect this? How does it affect that? And I tell people and they're like, oh, okay. Well, all right, well, that's interesting. And they go off and maybe learn. And then from learning about my experiences with MS, maybe then they'll go off and if they see somebody who's got a disability, they won't so much pick on them or treat them any different than say somebody who doesn't have a disability because it's not any, it's not abnormal or anything. It just is, you know, it is right. part of a person. Yeah. It's, it makes that person who they are really. I think, yeah, spreading awareness like that is great. I think there are some studies talking about how able people often don't see people in wheelchairs as like people worth considering yeah. um, right. or speaking to or like yeah. having a conversation with, which is, yeah. it, it, it's terrible. It's horrible. I've got a wheelchair, which I only have to use if I'm going like long distances and stuff because I can walk like short distances, but it looks like I need a wheelchair. And people do, they kind of ignore you or they'll reach over a shelf to get something for you instead of saying like, excuse mm. me and it's, or you know and it's just or they'll grab your wheelchair and push you out of the way and it's oh. like yeah i'm like i didn't ask for that and if a stranger comes up oh, behind gosh. you and pushes you out of the way you're like what you think somebody what's somebody doing you know it is unfortunately a common thing at least around here that people right. in wheelchairs who don't need help they're just maybe like just hanging in one spot for a moment and somebody will come up and push them because they think they need help. In reality, they don't need help. They're just maybe doing what anybody who's not a wheelchair is doing, maybe checking their phone or looking at some right. sites, but they'll push them out of the way. Yeah, minding their own business. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, oh my God. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I'm, I've got a 3D printer, which I'm gonna print like these little soft spikes to stick on my wheelchair handles. So if people grab them, they'll- <laughs> That's awesome. Get, they won't that's hurt cute. them. That's cute, I love that. They won't hurt them, but they'll be like, oh, could I mean, that's I, a good idea. Yeah, I know, so I saw it online, I was like, I have to do that. You know? Yeah. But, I mean, it sucks that, that you would even have to think about doing know, that just to have, you I know, know, personal boundaries, but it's a cool idea. Yeah, I know. I was like, I really need to do that. Get some, get some like, like bright colored filament and print it in bright colors and to warm people yeah. off. I mean, I don't mind, obviously, if I ask for help to, like, if I'm if somebody pushed me or whatever like that, but it, it and it's not just me. There's other people, too. I mean, I saw it at uni, too. I mean, they've got ramps, but people were helping and they didn't need help, and it's like, they didn't, it, did they ask for help, you know? I mean, if it's so weird. It, it is very weird. I mean, I people that are visually impaired. I mean, if they, it's like I ask them if they need help. I don't assume that they need help for a chair or a handle or something. I ask them if they need help, and if they do, I'll be like, okay, the chair is here, right? But I'm not gonna say grab the arm and be like, here's the chair. My assumption has always been that person lives. That's their daily life. Yeah. Like I'm sure they know how. They're an adult. They can handle themselves. They don't need a random stranger to come up and be like, "Here, let me do it for." Like that's exactly. It's weird when people think that mm -hmm. you have the right to just touch people in yeah. public for yeah. like any reason. Yeah. For I know. No, like without asking. So I think a part of the reason that that happens sometimes is because so my mother is like severely mentally ill, and she has been like for most of her adult life. She has schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, and she's often like infantilized. Mm in public or like medical professionals yeah. and that's very common in the dis disability community where like you are just not treated like a whole person yeah you're not i can speak from experience from that it you, people treat you they treat you like a child like that you're broken and you're not broken but you might need help sometimes but you'll ask if you do it's gotten to the point now like i fall a lot because my balance is all like it's like it's like being on a sailboat and but i'm so used to it now that unless i'm like on the floor bleeding it's kind of like okay just leave me i'll get up you know, and right. if somebody fell, I'd be the same thing as somebody. Whether they're disabled or not, I'd be asking them if they needed help. But if people, if they see somebody who's disabled, they just automatically assume that they need help rather than asking if they need help. If it, it doesn't happen as much with somebody who's able-bodied. They just assume that somebody needs help and they pull them up or something. And you could actually hurt somebody more doing that rather than yeah. maybe just holding a hand out so they can hold a hand rather than reefing somebody up in the air you could actually hurt somebody more if they've got like a joint disorder or something you yeah. could something could pop out and it would just cause more problems than good and i know it's done it's not done in a malicious way a lot of the stuff right. a lot of the stuff isn't done in, in a malicious way some people are trying to be helpful and trying to be good people they see somebody struggling they want to help at least some people with some kind of compassion do usually you know but it's still it's like an adult, like a grown person, you wouldn't automatically, you'd, you'd ask, you wouldn't just assume that somebody needed help. Yeah, right. It's so like a kid who is actually like six, who's like skin to knee, and it's like, oh, we'll get a towel so you can cover your knee up, you know? If I had been diagnosed when I was younger, it might have been different. I don't know what it's like to be disabled as a young kid. 
I mean, I was always a kid climbing trees, falling out of trees and stuff, and, you know, coming home with, like, bloody noses and stuff like that, but it's not disabled, it's completely different. So I can't relate to that, but as an adult, it, you do see that the people do treat you more like a kid, that you're, you know, not of sound mind kind of thing, that you're not going to be able to take care of yourself, which is not the best in the world, actually, when you think about it. You were saying, like, you want to be taken seriously like an adult, yeah. like you want to be, yeah. like, and that sort of undermines that whole idea. You mentioned that, you know, you had to quit oil painting. Yeah. I mean, I would like to hear about the experience of kind of learning about your diagnosis, kind of the emotions you went through, and kind of having to let go of parts of your art practice, and maybe what you would say to someone who's newly diagnosed and thinks that they might need to quit, or, or what you would give it, words of advice. Well, number one thing, you're diagnosed with any kind of dis disability, you don't have to quit. You know, or creating, if it's writing music, or playing music, or anything like that, you do not have to quit. You really don't have to quit. It actually would help your mental health if you continued on, because you can use an outlet, or if, if it's something that brings you joy to do in the first place, you know, you're not, you're not going to maybe be thinking, oh, I'm not going to be able to do this now, I'm not going to be able to do this now. You're gonna be th not going to be thinking the worst, even though obviously when you're first diagnosed, you think the worst. I mean, I was diagnosed, i have been having symptoms since I was probably um, about 18. So I st my legs started going numb, and I thought it was just from bike riding, because I was going on really long bike rides in the forest and stuff, so I just thought, you know, muscle tiredness and stuff. Or I had Lyme disease, <laughs> you know? <laughs> you're 18! One of the two. One of the two. Uh, because I lived in an area where there was lots of, but you're 18, you don't think about that, you don't yeah. really care at 18, you know? Yeah. Hey, I'm invincible, right. you know? And then it just kept happening, and then my hands would go numb, so I couldn't write right. Like, my hand, I couldn't hold a, a pencil right. I hold pens wrong, different anyway, but you couldn't, couldn't hold it right because your fingers would tremble, or you just can't feel your hands. And then I was diagnosed because I went to the GP, a doctor, a GP here, like general practitioner here, and then I went blind in my eye, my right eye. Oh. And it's quite common with people with MS at least, you, your nerves get damaged. And it right. came back, thankfully. But that's what made her think, hmm, this could be... So then you get sent to neurology and then they run like a lot of tests and stuff, like with any disability, trying to figure out what's wrong kind of thing, what's, hmm, what's yeah. not wrong, what is wrong kind of thing. So rule out some things and then, hmm, could maybe be this, but, and then diagnosed with MS. And my thought was, oh, um, great, I knew what, not, not great, but it, great that I knew what was, <laughs> it's like, hey, great, this is right. great that I knew what was perfect. wrong. Yeah, it's perfect. Yeah, yeah like, um, at least you know what's wrong. Yeah, yeah, that was my thing. And I'd known about MS because fundraisers for school and stuff, like middle school, so I knew what it was. But thankfully, because I was diagnosed 26, 27, so it's been a long time since I was like in middle school. So things have changed thankfully since then, like medical, like there's all kinds of meds I can give you and stuff which do help. But my first thought was, I'm gonna have to stop making art. This is, especially if my vision goes, because obviously with right. your, your peripheral vision goes, you're not gonna be able to make art. Mm. But mm -hmm. I, I've been drawing for so long, I couldn't do that. So I had to keep doing art. And with oil paints or paintings, like, I still got acrylic paint, but it's, it depends, really. But I had to give it up because hands are just, it's too hard to clean the brushes, too hard to, like, with all the chemicals involved, it's just got to be too dangerous yeah. to, not like to gotcha. cut myself or anything, but I can maybe do it outside, but it's Scotland, it rains a lot, so. Right. But it just, it, it's what I had to change, switch up to, I mean, I've been using colored pencils since I was like a teenager too, so use that more. Or start doing digital work, which is what I'm doing more now anyway, because it's just easier, because my hand's so shaky, you obviously have like right. s stabilizations with the digital programs right. and stuff. It's not so yeah. shaky. I love inking, that's what I really like doing, but my lines aren't really the best, and you can tell, it looks like I'm drunk. But the odd thing is, when you had a few, you're actually straighter, um, which is an odd thing. But because I didn't want to give it up, I was determined to find some way to do it, which is why I took graphic design because I figured if I end up completely in a wheelchair, I can still do that in a desk job. But right. Oh, okay. Interesting. Yeah. I could have done like fine art and stuff, but it's a little harder to do that in a wheelchair. Right. It's doable. You can still do it, but it's slightly more difficult getting, especially getting around campus and stuff because the building was an older building, so some levels weren't accessible, but the graphic part was. So. That's one of the main reasons I did that. I do, did kind of like it too, but it wasn't like doing this because I'm stuck doing this. Right. But I mean, the other thing is it's hard to get a job because of a disability. 
because people don't want right. to deal with it. So it w didn't really matter anyway, unless you did like freelance stuff, which you can do obviously, which I'm looking more into, obviously the online posting and all this stuff, you post like all the print on demand online and stuff, which is helpful for people. Yeah. yeah. And of course, you know, you've got Kofi and, or coffee, or however you pronounce it. I don't know either. <laughs> no, nobody seems to know. I'm like, is it coffee or is it Kofi? Mm. I say both I think every it's time Kofi. just in yeah. case. Oh, okay. I think, I think it's, I think it's Kofi, but I'm not, I'm not 100%. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> And then Patreon, of course, actually helps a lot of people. Yeah. So there are ways to do it. If, if, if you have a disability, that is a little bit easier if you do it online. Even freelance can be sometimes easier if you're disabled because then you can work around your own schedule. Like, say, if you have a bad day or if you medication flare-up or a flare-up of symptoms, you know, you can say, okay, I'm going to take this day off, but I can finish it tomorrow. Right. Kind of thing. It's easier for somebody with this disability to be freelance or work online when you work like from home kind of for like a company and stuff. A lot since now because of the plague, people are doing that more. Right. <laughs> so that made it easier for a lot of disabled people to stay in full-time employment. So it is possible, it's just you need those adaptations to be made, which some companies are better than others obviously. Right. I don't know what it's like there because I mean you have to, like discriminate like disability acts and stuff. discrimination Yeah, yes. same thing yeah. here. Technically, you're not supposed to, but it still happens. Obviously, unfortunately. Right. Yeah. I mean, because soon as somebody found out, like I'll use me as an example again, that I had MS, it'd be like, oh, well, we're gonna have to do this, we're gonna have to do that, we're gonna have to adapt this, and then people aren't gonna hire you because of it, because they're gonna right. have to change so much. So it's easier for somebody with disabilities to be freelance or work from home if they can, because you don't have to deal with that. So it is still possible to have yeah. a job with, like, an artistic job with disabilities. It just might be a little bit more work on your side to find something that fits, whether that's freelancing, working for yourself, or finding a company that will work with you. Because some companies will. Some are a lot better than they used to be, obviously. Are there changes that you wish certain platforms like Ko-fi and Patreon and stuff would make to be more accommodating to people with disabilities? Like, are there, are there anything, is there any, like, changes that you wish people would make to these platforms? I don't know, because... I don't have problems reading off a screen, so I don't know how it reacts to somebody mm -hmm. who needs a screen reader or who can't, like, you know, the, the, the graphics, they, they're too much or they can't see them. I don't know how that works. Right. If, if it, it isn't set up for that, I really hope it is set up for that for people that do use screen readers. I really hope it is because if they're not, they're taking away a section of the population that, yeah. that could use their, you know, platform and, you know, it, it would be good for them too because it would show that they're more, you know, they're willing to do that to be more, you know, inclusive of people with disabilities. You mentioned, like, the print-on-demand services. Yeah. That's something that I've never even thought about, being helpful for someone who might have a disability yeah. who can't, you know, do the packaging because it's so much, like, little stuff and I never, th or who just can't, like, go out to the post office, yeah. to the post office regularly. I never thought about, like, those yeah. print-on-demand services would be so great for someone who can't access yeah. those things normally. Like, I used to have an Etsy store, so I would pack up mm -hmm. art, like, original art, or I'd print prints off here because the, the printer, but it became too much work. It was too much work making right. sure they weren't getting bent or that they actually get there on time or... So, do having the print-on-demand definitely makes it a lot easier on that aspect. I would love to open up, like, an Etsy store or another online store for, like, commissions, but it is the not having to package everything or worry too much about taxes or anything, it makes it easier on somebody with a disability. Yeah. Do you feel, like, if, when you're watching artists online, mm -hmm. and you, like, Lee's, like, vlogs, is there anything that you feel that when you watch those videos and you're picturing your life as an artist, is there any major difference because of your disability that you feel like maybe this isn't something that's accessible for me? Or do you feel that kind of that, that life is fully there, it might just be different? I think it'd be different. Sense? It's still there, it's just different. You know, like okay. I said, it is still there. I mean, there are some things obviously you see, it's like, no, I'm not going to be able to do that. But it is possible. Like I said before, it's just about adapting and knowing what you can do yourself. And if you need help, asking for it. Because the help is there, you just have to ask for it. You know, that was the hardest thing when I was first diagnosed, and I still have problems with it, right. asking for help, because you want to be independent. Same thing with art, you, right. you want to be able to do it all yourself, because you've been doing it all yourself for so long, but from the time where you have to realize, nope, you need help, or you can't do that because it's too dangerous. Like, I can't use, like, I shouldn't use, like, knives or anything like that, because my fingers go numb, so get somebody else to cut it. So it's realizing stuff like that, that when you can still create, you're just something you can't do. You know? 
because yeah. safety reasons mostly. Are there, I don't actually really know of any prominent artists that are outspoken about any disabilities that they have. Do you know of any creators online that would represent the disability community that are artists? Oh, or do you think this is an area where there could be more representation? I mean, truly there can be more representation. There can always be more <laughs> yeah. representation. Yeah. But like, are there any that you know of specifically that we should, we should I pay don't attention know, to? actually. That's um, a good question. I'm gonna have to go look that up. I looked up this like visual, visually impaired artists because I was like, okay, there has to be some. And they do, they paint like the right. fingers, like the textures and stuff. But I don't actually know, to tell you the truth. I don't actually know. It's a good question though, because there should be more people, you know, that are disabled and more, not so much in the spotlight, but more aware right, of their... just existing. Yeah, yeah. 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 You'd, you'd think with as many like popular artists, like specifically on YouTube, in my mind, with as many popular artists there are, you'd think there would be one who has like a, a disability, but I genuinely, I'm trying to think of someone, I can't think of anyone. Obviously that will affect someone who's just diagnosed and like whether or not they think the art career is possible right. for them. Yeah. So representation is, is really important yeah. because not only like could that creator provide like actionable feedback and like tips, yeah. you know, like if you have these hand tremors, maybe use this thing instead, but like just being seen and represented on the other side of the screen is just so important. Yeah, I can't think of any like big name YouTubers either that, that I mean, I follow a lot of art, other artists and I don't think any of them ever mentioned any disability really. I mean, I don't even think right. I've, I've, me I've mentioned it in passing, but I've never actually made a specific video about it. Maybe I should. No, um, <laughs> It could be interesting. Yeah. Not that any yeah. creator like needs to disclose their disabilities, but it is interesting that yeah. I can't think of anyone no. ever even mentioning anything in passing. No. Which I mean, honestly, I'm not. I'm not really surprised by actually that like there's not a prominent like disabled no. creator. Yeah, no, I can't in, think of in the art. Sphere. I mean, I'm not prominent in like art thing and stuff like that. I mean, but that's actually a good idea. Maybe I should do that. I mean, even if yeah. like a dozen people see it or fifty people, it's still. 50 people yeah, that yeah. might at least be more aware of yeah because no I, now i'm like i'm constantly yeah. thinking and i cannot think of anybody yeah. that's so even in passing have said something that yeah no yeah i'm gonna have to if you do my make business a video, brain says that's a market gap yeah, <laughs> for real yeah yeah. If you do make a video talking about it, definitely send us the link and okay. we'll, we, we'll, we'll link to your video. Okay, yeah. I think that would be and awesome for you, people to see. Yeah. And also if you find any creators that do, like, you know, yeah, I'll, talk I'll have about to that stuff, we'll we would love to know. A bit yeah. of research to, like, see if I can find anybody or whether on YouTube or online that's, you know, that talks about their disability in relation to their art, especially. Yeah. Because I can't think of anybody. There, are, there have to be a few. Yeah. There have to be. Right. But, I mean, the net is huge, yeah. so... You're not gonna, you know, find everything. I know, yeah. It's it's just weird. You could always be the change that you want to see in the true, world. True, yeah. very true. This could be you. We've had, I mean, we've had a great conversation. I feel like I, this is like a, a part of the world that I obviously have not really been exposed to, and specifically for art, it's not something I've ever even thought about. Yeah. About how it might affect people's careers and abilities and their practice. So this has been really enlightening. Yeah. Thank you so much for like yeah. sharing your yeah. story and yeah. opening up. Yeah. This was yeah. really interesting. That's what I mean, I thought about it because. My uncle, who's passed away, he was disabled from the neck down, but he was still able to, mm -hmm. like, paint, like, figurines and pots and stuff because he had a headband with a brush on it, so he could still paint wow. with his neck. So I thought, okay, well, see, that's what I said. If you, even if you're that disabled, you can still be creative, you know? And yeah, I wish yeah. more people thought that, that as long as you, f there's kind of the whole, the will, if there's a way, there's a, what is it? If there's a will, there's a way kind well, of there's thing. there's a way, yeah. there's a way. So, I mean, and obviously, disability is going to affect everybody differently. I mean, if somebody, and I don't want, don't want to say determined, because that makes somebody seem like they're not trying, and I don't want somebody to feel right, like they're yeah. not trying. There are ways around it if people are willing to maybe look yeah. at different ways to do things, you know? I've grown up around severe mental illness, like, my whole life, but uh, physical disability is not really a thing that I've ever been strongly exposed to. I had some friends in college that used a cane in a wheelchair, but, but yeah, like, it wasn't really a, a thing that I grew up a lot yeah. around. There's a huge population of disabled people in varying degrees sometimes just pushed off in a corner kind of to yeah. just and that's changed it has changed a lot but it still unfortunately happens whether physical or mental it still can happen with mental disabilities too the people are just kind of shoved in a corner and forgotten about unfortunately this conversation has been so great we yeah. have so i've rambled so a lot to have i'm sorry you on. <laughs> no oh, it's, it it's was okay amazing i learned a yeah, lot and i think that's good <laughs> i really hope this episode reaches like just somebody who well, could take your words to heart and maybe it'll change their lives you, know? The you never thing. know i don't want somebody to think that with a, dis a, a diagnosis it is a horrible thing 
obviously because they're like, oh, my life is over kind of thing, but it really isn't. It's just different. It's not never going to be the same, obviously, but it's just, and that can be hard to deal with too. It's just asking for help and it's, it's, it's all it would yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Mm -hmm. we, we had a, like we said, we had a great time. <laughs> thank you. And this is definitely something that I will continue to think about and try to, you know, be, be better at in my understanding of the world and yeah. being more accessible and more inclusive. So thank you so much okay. for, for sharing this with us. We had a great time. Thank you for having yeah, me. Yeah, we did. Thank you so much. <laughs> of course. If you find one of those creators that we were talking about earlier, definitely let us know and I'm gonna, absolutely yeah. plug them. I'm going to have to go off and look at that and find, hopefully find somebody, you know, hopefully. Yeah. There has to well, be. I'm going to look too. I mean, yeah. There's got to be someone out there. There has to be, you know, and I'll probably make that video anyway, just to put it out there kind of thing, you know? All right. Cool. <laughs> All right. Thank you okay. so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Jen. Bye. <laughs> so we really want to thank Jennifer again for being on the episode. That was awesome. I sort of hinted at it in the episode, but both of my parents have severe mental illness. And so like, I have the experience of growing up around that and having my life be affected by that and addiction separately like as it applies to them. But like I, I never experienced that. Like I have migraines sometimes. Like obviously it's not comparable in any sense of the word to my productivity levels or like what I can and can't do in my daily life. So I really appreciate that Jennifer reached out to yeah. us and that we were able to get her on the podcast to sort of bring some representation to people. And if, if anyone else out there who listens has some sort of disability that affects their practice that they, they would like to share their perspective, we'd love to hear it. Because like I said, this is something, you know, Kelsey has some some experience. I really have no experience in terms of disability that affects daily life, um, whether secondhand or firsthand. So hearing from Jennifer was really interesting. It was, it was something that I, I genuinely, I don't know how, but I've never thought about it. So it was really, really interesting to just hear how I never thought that like, there were so many things that she brought up that I was like, wow, I literally never considered that. So that was really cool. Yeah. Yeah. And I think like the YouTube community particularly like seems to filter for more abled people maybe because like there's a lot that goes into it like a lot of like fiddling with individual camera settings and like having to have like that consistent schedule and stuff or like whatever right. but i really hope that there are some careers out there that help the community feel more represented oh. and that have found some way to make it work and if you know of any if you're watching this we would love to hear from you um we would also love yes. to hear about your story if you have any advice that you want to share with other people that would maybe have just been recently diagnosed we would we would love to hear about that and also i hope that this episode has been able to be encouraging or at least eye-opening for anyone who has been recently diagnosed to let you know that like it is still possible for you and that you yeah. still don't have to give up anything that you really really enjoy in life we do have a comment section to wrap up this episode this is the comment section highlight so every so often we will highlight some comments that you guys leave and it's just kind of a way for us to engage with this community and also to encourage you guys to engage. Uh, nudge, nudge, yeah, wink, so wink. leave a comment. <laughs> All right, so Al, do you want to read the comment? Yes. So some art studios asked us for some advice about a specific topic. They said that they've been wanting to start a YouTube channel, but they aren't really sure whether or not showing their face would kind of help or limit growth. And then they talk about, you know, some people suggest showing their face. They want to reach an audience of adults rather than kids as their main target audience. So they're worried about a cartoony persona kind of being more catering towards kids. Not sure if people like voiceovers. So that whole genre of the whole idea of like, show your face or don't show your face. And where does that leave you as a creator? Yeah, I think it's definitely possible to grow a channel without showing your face. 100% um, yeah. really possible. I follow multiple Drawing accounts waffles. that do this. Oh yeah, there are tons of, you know, very big accounts that do not yeah. do this. I think you are going to have to be a little more creative. That's not necessarily a bad thing. I think being really creative early on will probably help you grow rather than hinder it because yeah. you'll have to make more interesting content <laughs> to make up for the yeah. fact that you don't have a face like in your content. So yeah, I think voiceovers really helps storytelling, especially like if you can tell a story with your B-roll footage, with like your time lapse, with your voiceover, make it cohesive, make it interesting, limit the amount of exit points you have in your videos. So like boring stretches or whatever. I also don't think necessarily that a VTuber like channel is necessarily like super cartoony or caters to a younger right. audience. There are lots of VTubers on the internet. Not all of them have a really young audience. It totally depends For on sure. like the persona that you create and the kind of content that you have. So a VTuber or like, when I say VTuber, I mean like a drawn thing in any style that has multiple expressions. So it'll like flip back and forth or like sometimes they're animated. That doesn't necessarily have to be cartoony. Right. 
it could be in whatever style you want it to be. So yeah, I would say this is totally possible. I would say that it's probably not going to hinder your growth necessarily, as long as you make your content more interesting to make up for that. And I also think voiceovers are still very common, yeah. as long as, again, you make them interesting. So I, I personally don't think it really even matters that much. I don't notice. Like, a lot of times I'll be watching a YouTuber and I like won't even notice that I'm not seeing their face. I mean, it also depends on how much of, like, you you are willing to show. If you kind of just want to hide your identity and you just don't want to show your face, you can always show your body in it and so it still feels like you're there. We have your voice and we see your hands moving. It feels like you're there. But if you, like, don't want to show yourself at all, that might be a little bit harder to work around. Getting nice B-roll shots might be a little bit more difficult. I think there's plenty of things that you can do without showing your face that won't make it feel weird. Uh, if you're not comfortable showing your face, you definitely don't have to. Yeah. I will say, I think showing your face allows for a real connection with your audience that you might not get otherwise. I think drawing with at least is a good example. It's easier to get. It might not be impossible, right, exactly. but it's definitely easier to get. Yeah. Yeah. I think about drawing with waffles and there's always this frustration that I feel when I'm watching her because it's like I can't picture her talking. Like I, I'm so, I know her because I watch a lot of her videos, but it's like I can't picture her and there, it's always kind of frustrating to me. For me personally, I'm sure that's not everyone's experience, but I think it's, it's so much easier to feel like you have that connection with someone when you can see their face. So that is something to think about. It's not necessary. You can, you can get that without having someone's face in the video, but it kind of depends on what you're you're willing to do. I don't think either way it hinders or helps so dramatically that like you have to make a decision. So that is our episode. I hope you guys had a great time and we will yeah. see you in the next one. We're hoping to have an episode out every single week. Hopefully. I don't, we I don't know how to. that's going to pan out, but it's it's our goal. It's our goal. And we also just recently hit 1,000 subscribers. So thank you guys so much for coming over to the podcast, for liking, for subscribing, for commenting. Nudge, nudge, wink, wink. Uh, <laughs> and that's, that's it. That's our episode. We'll see you guys in the next one. Bye. Bye.